Shalom and welcome to Temple Talk. This is Yitzhak Rubin speaking to you from the south of Jerusalem here in the holy, beautiful, blessed land of Israel. Today is the 17th day of the month of Adar, Adar Sheni, second Adar. The year is 5784. It is also March 26th, 2024. This coming Shabbat, we read the second parasha, the second Torah reading of the book of Leviticus called Tzav. Begins Levit- Leviticus chapter 6, verse 1, concludes chapter 8, verse 36. And in addition to Tzav, we're also reading what we refer to as Parshat Para, about the red heifer, the third of the four special uh, Torah readings that we read throughout the month of Adar in preparation for Pesach, which comes in just less than one month from today. Uh, the first parsha was we read, I think, three weeks ago, which was uh, Machasit Shekel, Parshat Shkolim, the half shekel offering. And then we had a week off. And this past week, of course, we read Parshat Zachor, which is connected to Purim, which we celebrated uh, Motzei Shabbat, Saturday evening and Sunday. And people in Jerusalem celebrated on Sunday evening, Monday. And people in some other cities where it's not known for sure if they were walled cities during the time of Yoshua, the time of that Joshua led Israel into and conquered Canaan, Canaan. Uh, but those cities existed then, and they might or might not have been walled. So custom in modern times has been to celebrate, I believe, both days. And those cities are Hebron and Shiloh. And um, there may be others that I'm not aware of. Um, and this week, we read the third of the four uh, special uh, parashot, special readings. And that is para, about the red heifer. We'll be talking about that in just a moment. And the following week, we'll be reading Parashat Ahodesh. And of course, of the four special readings, three of them are directly connected to and in preparation for Passover. Machatzit HaShekel, Parshat Shkolim, about the half-shekel offering. Of course, we've talked about, and the half-shekel offering was was always uh, collected during the month of Adar, uh, because, among other things, the new month of Nisan, the month of Passover, is the new year. It's the new year in Israel, uh, we have four New Years, as you are aware of. Maybe more familiar with Rosh Hashanah being a New Year, but of course we're told in the Torah that Rosh Hashanah occurs on the seventh month. The first month is, the first of your months, the month of the Exodus from Egypt is, is Nisan. And uh, Nisan is the New Year for the, the religious uh, festival cycle, the religious calendar, also the New Year in terms of... Uh, kings in terms of their tracking their reign and it's a new year of course for like i said for for the for the reckoning of the festivals and how they fall out etc etc and so uh the half shekel is always collected just before the new year because it's used that money is used for the public offerings that are made throughout the year on behalf of all israel and the uh, second of the three that are directly connected to Passover is this week, Parshat Para, the red heifer, because, of course, as we all know, the red heifer, the ashes of the red heifer are uh, necessary for attaining the highest level of, of purity, uh, which is required in order to enter into uh, the inner courts of, on the Temple Mount, the inner courts of the Temple. And uh, uh, so any pilgrim who would be coming to, to uh, celebrate Passover in Jerusalem and who would be bringing their Passover offering up to the Temple Mount and into the inner courtyard where it would be slaughtered uh, would need to be, have achieved this highest level of purity, um, purity from the impurity that... Uh, happens with contact with a corpse um, and so uh, 
the ashes of the red heifer were were very necessary for people to be able to uh, properly uh, ascend to the Temple Mount. So um, we read it uh, especially during the month of Adar in preparation for Passover, even though it actually is appears in the Torah and Parshat Chukat, which is in the Book of Numbers, which we uh, won't be reading Parshat Chukat for a few months from now. But we read the special uh, 22 verses, actually, about the, the Para Aduma, the Red Heifer, which begins in, in the Book of Numbers, chapter 19, verse 1, right through verse 22, all about the Red Heifer. Um, before I go on, I just want to add that the Temple Institute's website, uh, templeinstitute.org, now has two separate uh, very in-depth, detailed, and fully illustrated entries about the red heifer. You can find them both uh, if you go to our uh, drop-down menu and go to study tools and you'll see their listed red heifer and there's two separate uh, uh, very, uh, like I say, very in-depth articles about the red heifer. One uh, focuses more on spiritual aspects and one perhaps more on technical, but they're both fascinating and um, well worth reading. I know that uh, those pages get a lot of visits. The Red Heifer is always a big, big, um, a lot of excitement about the Red Heifer, um, not uh, simply among Jews, but also, of course, among Gentiles. And, of course, anybody who is anticipating and looking forward to uh, the rebuilding of the Holy Temple uh, knows that the red heifer, the ashes of the red heifer are an essential element in getting there and um, which is why the Temple Institute has been working very intently and intensely uh, for many years in um, studying, learning about the red heifer and of course in attempting to raise a red heifer that would be kosher and fit uh, to be well slaughtered and burned and turned into ash and mixed with the other elements of the ashes of the red heifer and used for purification we're coming closer and closer as you may know I'm sure you know that um, just under two years ago <coughs> <coughs> Just under two years ago, uh, we were uh, we cooperated in bringing five young red heifers into Israel from the state of Texas, and they're being raised here. They're in Shiloh right now, and uh, I've been tracking their status, and. Um, I can't give you anything definite about their status, meaning are they still kosher, are they still completely red, and not all of them are. So some of them are already no longer valid candidates, other ones are, um, there's a, a bit of uncertainty, which is the, the best I can describe right now, but uh, don't, um, don't be in despair, um, because as long as we are in the process of of raising and and uh, he red heifers and encouraging more red heifers, um, we'll get there. And in the meantime, uh, we have the Temple Institute has been conducting a, a series of experiments, um, which kind of wood to use in the fire in order to create the the proper uh, heat for for incinerating the 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 red heifer and in creating the best ashes because the wood that's burned in the fire are part of the ashes so you have the ashes of the heifer itself you have the wood used for the fire you have also the cedar wood which is thrown into the mix and also um, hyssop and also the wool dyed with uh, a tolat shani red dye also tossed into the mix and, and turned into ash so uh, the Temple Institute has been conducting very uh, serious uh, experiments and tests and practice runs uh, for the actual 
uh, ceremony of the burning and uh, creating of the ashes of the red heifer. So that also has to be uh, studied and learned and perfected uh, before we can uh, actually uh, produce the, the ashes. So we're working on that very intently uh, tomorrow or tomorrow, yes, the 27th of March, there will be in Shiloh a conference uh, about the red heifer. A number of rabbis are participating, will be speaking, include, including Rabbi Azaria Ariel of the Temple Institute. Rabbi Azaria is the son of the Temple Institute's founder, Yisrael Ariel, and he's also the head of our research department. And he is the expert on the red heifer. He has been studying it intensely as well as studying biblical laws of purity and has written uh, extensively about the red heifer. Um, and part of our efforts uh, in the Temple Institute concerning the red heifer is to, is to get as many uh, rabbis here in Israel on board with our efforts with the aim to to create the ashes uh, and uh, so to that end uh, Rav Azaria has been meeting with and speaking and and which is another reason why we're having a conference uh, in order to explain what we're doing what we're trying to achieve what we know and uh, to um, get the interest and the um, cooperation and the the okay really from from top uh, rabbis throughout Israel so it is a project that's of course anything that has to do with the temple is a project project that's bigger than than us it's bigger than the Temple Institute and this is certainly a project that the Temple Institute wants to move forward with with as many uh, people on board as possible uh, we don't we don't uh, talk about it too much because I know it just creates a lot of excitement and we don't want to, uh, you know, be going through a cycle of raising people's hopes and then perhaps uh, dashing their hopes because we don't quite yet have a red heifer. Um, so we keep it a little bit low-keyed. But yes, you can be assured that uh, we are working on it all the time. And... Um, every day we're getting closer and the fact is that anything we want to achieve in life uh, any proper thing any worthwhile goal uh, is something that's achieved through the our efforts and through the uh, the blessing of Hashem and uh, when the right time comes and the, and the right heifer has been has been raised we will have the red heifer and we'll produce the ashes so we're doing what we can do um, working very hard at it and we know that that's what Hashem wants to see from us and uh, when the time is right Hashem will see to it that our efforts prove successful so stay tuned and stick with us and um, don't be dismayed um, if uh, we don't have the ashes tomorrow or the next day, but we'll get there. We will get there, and uh, once we do, yes, it will be a big breakthrough because, like I said, that will enable uh, a people to even today, even before the Holy Temple is built, to enter into areas which are halakhically forbidden from us to enter into right now. Uh, anybody who goes up to the Temple Mount now goes up the first go to a mikveh, and you attain a certain level of purity but uh, certainly not the highest level, and it's a level that's good enough uh, for um, being on the perimeters of the Temple Mount, because the Temple Mount, the, uh, as you get closer to the, to the Holy Temple where it stood and the inner courtyards, and the level of sanctity ra rises. And so, uh, for example, anyone who is tame mate has the impurity of contact with a corpse and has not been uh, purified via the ashes of the red heifer cannot go beyond what was known as the as the hill, which was a uh, uh, a low wall around the inner courtyards of the temple. So uh, we don't anybody who goes up to the Temple Mount today stays 
uh, far away from those forbidden areas, but if we had the ashes of the red heifer and could achieve the purity that is necessary, we could enter into the innermost places, uh, the innermost courtyards of the of the holy temple, even uh, while the temple has not uh, is is unbuilt. We just finished celebrating Purim. I mentioned that before. It was a very, uh, for many people, a difficult Purim this year because of all the the war that we're in the middle of and all the loss of lives and of the hostages. Um, I was at a Purim Suda, Purim uh, feast, where the hosts, um, before we partook of any any food or beverage, the hosts asked for forgiveness, as it were, and, and for permission of, of people who have have lost members of their family, even either uh, on this, during the, the 7th of October, this, the massacre of the 7th, or have lost people in Gaza since, uh, soldiers, or have people in uh, captivity right now. The host, our host and hostess asked for their forgiveness for us celebrating when uh, people are are in such difficult circumstances, but it's also understood that uh, there is a power and a strength in celebrating in simcha. Simcha is the Hebrew word that means happiness, often translated as joy. It's a very holy word, and it refers to the happiness of being near to Hashem, the happiness of holiness, the happiness of walking in Hashem's ways. It's not a frivolous happiness. It's not uh, fun. It can be fun, but it's not fun. It's true happiness, true feeling of, of joy, of contentment, of, of closeness, not only to Hashem, but to one another. Um, so it's very important that we take the opportunity anytime we can to to reach that level of, of, of simcha, um, right when we every time we have a festival we say Hag Sameach we say Purim Sameach it's from the word Simcha Sameach to be happy to have that joy it's very important and it gives us strength and it's really important even and especially in difficult times um, Simcha is is such an essential part of of Judaism such an essential part of 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 the Torah as we know in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, there's uh, a long list of all the the uh, klalot, all the, uh, the the curses that will that will befall uh, upon Israel if we should stray from Hashem's way and and not follow His commandments, not do the mitzvot. And as you know, it's a very long, lengthy, and uh, very uh, sorrowful. Uh, list of bad things that will happen, and at one point, uh, we're told it says these things will happen because you did not do Hashem's commandments in happiness, b'simcha. Right? It's not enough simply to fulfill the commandment what Hashem asks us to do. We need to do it with simcha, with happiness, with the joy that uh, that that naturally occurs when we do Hashem's will. And so if we're not doing it with happiness, we're not really doing it. So happiness, simcha, is totally a part, an essential part of, of Judaism. And in times like the difficult times we're going through today, uh, to not be happy, to not show simcha when we're commanded to show simcha is to is to admit defeat. It's to be defeated by our enemies. And when we can rise above the pain and 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 be happy and sameach. And there were wonderful, wonderful celebrations on Purim. And again, they weren't frivolous. They weren't. Uh, we're not talking about uh, uh, you know just fun and games. We're talking about true happiness. That's a sign of victory. We can still reach that, and we will reach, and we always will reach it, and we will, we will. It will be part of our ability to over overcome the loss and the sadness uh, that we're feeling here in Israel uh, this year. 
So let's speak a little bit about Parshat Tzav. Like I said, it's the second Parsha. Last week was the beginning of the book of Vayikra. We didn't really talk about it much late last week because we, last week we really focused on Purim and Zachor. We talked a lot about the Parshat Zachor. Um, but of course, the book of Leviticus is focuses to a great extent on the work of the Kohanim, the temple priests, on the inner workings of the tabernacle, which would later be the inner workings of the holy temple. And it also goes on to talk about the responsibilities of the Kohanim outside the tabernacle of, in terms of uh, people uh, that we'll learn about later, the tsar, uh, Tsarat, uh, uh, what's re uh, often translated as leprosy, but it's not really leprosy. We're talking about that in later weeks and about uh, foods and things that are uh, permissible, things that aren't permissible, and things about purity, which all have a spiritual attachment and connection to the the tabernacle and to the work of the of the Kohanim. Uh, so for that reason, uh, sometimes the Leviticus is referred to in Hebrew as Torah to Kohanim, the teaching of the Kohanim. The word Torah, by the way, literally means teaching. Uh, sometimes, you know, it's translated as law, which is a very lovely translation, but that can also be a little bit uh, intimidating, I think, the law. But it's a teaching. It teaches us. It teaches us how to how to uh, do what we can do to, to be close to Hashem and to create a, a society that... Uh, is is unified and that helps one another and supports one another and looks out for one another. That's what the Torah is trying to teach us. Um, Parshat Sav begins. I'll read the first few uh, verses. First few psukim, chapter six, verse one. Vayedber Hashem El Moshe lemot Sav et Aaron et Banav lemot Zot Torah Haola Hi Haola Al Mukda Al Mizbeach Kol Alayla Ad Aboker Ove Eishem Mizbeach Tukad Bo Ola Vash Akohen Mido Vad Umich Nesevad Ilabash Al Basaro Veherim Et Adeshin Asher Al Asher Tochal Haish Et Aola the <laughs> These verses are verses that uh, we read each morning uh, uh, in the first uh, part of our of our tefillah in the morning, of our prayer in the morning. We read many verses that uh, describe the service in the Holy Temple, the daily service in the Holy Temple. That's how we begin our prayer. Uh, here it is in English. Hashem spoke to Moshe, saying, Command Aaron and his son, saying, This is the law of the burnt offering. It is the burnt offering that stays on the flame on the altar all night until the morning, and the fire of the altar sh should be kept the flame on it. The Kohen shall don his fitted linen tunic, and he shall don linen breeches on his flesh. He shall separate the ash of what the fire consumed of the burnt offering on the altar and place it next to the altar. He shall remove his garments and don other garments and he shall remove the ash to the outside of the camp to a pure place. A fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it. It shall not be extinguished. And the Kohen shall kindle wood upon it every morning. He shall prepare the burnt offering upon it and shall cause the fats of the peace offerings to go up and smoke upon it. A permanent fire shall remain aflame on the altar. It shall not be extinguished. So as we know the there are daily offerings in the tabernacle and holy temple, uh, a lamb in the morning and a lamb in the afternoon. And the uh, lamb in the afternoon would be placed on the on the fire on the altar, and uh, it would be consumed uh, and uh, throughout the the evening and the night. And as it states here uh, explicitly, the fire must be kept going all the time. And the next morning. The ashes from the previous day's offerings would be cleared off the altar by the Kohanim and placed uh, in a special place. And this is often uh, 
seen to teach us, we, we understand that uh, yesterday's offerings, yesterday's prayers, yesterday's desires, yesterday's achievements, they're all good, God willing, but they're yesterday. Today's a new day. We clean off what was yesterday and we start again. Every day is a new day. Every day in creation is a new day in creation. We read in our in our tefillah and our prayer in the morning that basically every day God creates the world anew. A fresh start. What a blessing that we can begin each day anew and don't have to be burdened or held down by what was. I mean, our past and what happened yesterday is, of course, very important. But we are given the opportunity each day to start afresh, to do something new, and to be a new person and to be a better person, hopefully. And again, not to be burdened by, you know, what might have been. What might have been was, and now it's a new day. And uh, that is the lesson of the cleaning off of yesterday's ashes from the altar. The uh, Parshat Sav, and the word Sav means command, uh, Parshat Sav goes on to describe in great detail all the different kinds of offerings. It's in a continuation really from last week's Parsha, all the different kinds of offerings that can be offered upon the altar. It also describes the inauguration, this, the the uh, sanctification of Aharon, the Kohen Gadol high priest, and his sons. We read how Moshe himself actually uh, dressed Aharon with his big day kuhuna, his, his priestly garments, of course, of the, of the Kohen Gadol, and also his sons. And they were anointed with anointing oil. And Saul, in preparation for the inauguration, dedication of the tabernacle, which we'll be reading about next week in Parshat Shmini. And the, and the actual inauguration of the tabernacle took place on the first day of Nisan, right? The new year of the second year, the first day of Nisan of the second year after Israel had been, of course, left Egypt on the 15th of Nisan the previous year. So Israel's been just under a year in the wilderness, um, and look what they've achieved. You know, we we think about their, you know, their complaining. We think about the the golden calf, but look at the bright side. Uh, they're at Mount Sinai. They received the Torah, and now they have built a tabernacle. Uh, no, no small thing, and they did it uh, as 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 one. Everybody worked on it together. So these are still talking about what will take place in the tabernacle and about the dedication of Aaron and his sons. Um, we didn't really talk about it last week. Like I said, we were focusing on Purim. So let's just go back a little bit to Parshat Vayikra that has that very fascinating opening verse um, which goes Vayikra el Moshe Vayedeber Hashem el Elav me'ol moed, that um, Moshe basically was standing outside the the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, because we read last week when Moshe set up the tabernacle that uh, that Hashem filled it with his with his kavod, with his presence, with his shechina, with a great cloud of of glory. And to the extent that nobody could go in because Hashem's presence was just so powerful there. You, it was like a force field. You couldn't go in. Yet, the the work, the service of the that takes place each day in the, in the tabernacle and temple, of course, requires the presence of, of, of the Kohanim. They have to be able to enter and Moshe needs to be able to enter because we're told that, that Hashem will speak to Moshe from... from uh, between the Kruvim, the Cherubim, on top of the, on top of the Ark of the Covenant. So what gives here? And of course, I think I might have explained it last week, but I'll explain it again now. Um, very interesting. The first word Vayikra is spelled, and he called. 
spelled Vav Yud Kuf Reish Aleph, and the Aleph is always written in the Sefer Torah, Torah scroll, and even in most uh, um, Humashim, the, a, a printed book of the of the Torah. Uh, the Aleph is small. Now, Aleph is the first letter of the Aleph Bet, the alpha, Hebrew alphabet, um, and it's among other things is the first letter of the word Ani, which means me, or Anochi, which also means me. And also the first letter of Elohim, God. And um, it's diminished. And what the Torah is teaching us here is that Tashem, who first of all, he's not mentioned by name in the first half of the verse. Second of all, the Aleph, which is, which is uh, either can be Ani or Elohim, is diminished, meaning Hashem he, he contracts his presence in the tabernacle. He makes room. He diminishes his presence to the extent that people can, can now uh, enter in. Moshe can enter in. The Kohanim can enter in. And again, this is uh, very, very, very uh, similar. It's a repeat of creation itself because Hashem's presence uh, is limitless. So where can God find a place within his infinite presence in order to create a world. So our teachers teach us that Hashem had to create a void, as it were, within his, within himself in order to be able to fill that void with creation and then re-enter his presence into it. So this idea is called simtsum, of diminishing and uh, basically, any act of, you know, tzni'ut, of, of modesty, of anava, another word for modesty, of, of allowing others into our lives, of giving space, giving uh, respect and honor to others, which means, you know, diminishing ourselves a bit, taking a little bit so that they can enter into, into our heart, into our mind, into our thoughts, into our lives. It's all the same process of tzimtzum of contraction. That's how we make room for one another. That's how Hashem made room for us. And that's how we made room for Hashem when we built a tabernacle. We we took a space and and created a border around it that would that would limit our presence there. So that Hashem could place his presence there. This is how our relationship with Hashem works and this is how our relationship with, with one another works. And the, the mitzvot, the commandments, they're all, in each one in its own way, is a process by which we are, we are diminishing ourselves or creating a, a space in ourselves so that Hashem can enter. And we create that space by doing, by performing the commandments, by, by letting off of our own will, of our own ego, of our own I, me, mine. We do that by by performing a commandment. It allows Hashem's presence to to join us, and that's the beauty of mitzvot, and um, that's the beauty of everything that the Torah is trying to teach us. Uh, the ways of Hashem, uh, all the different details, and you can say, "Wow, there's so many things you got you can do, and so many things you can't do," and it's. Uh, you know, it's such a burden and uh, you have no freedom anymore. You have to do this, you have to do No, not at all. It's not a burden. It's liberating and we have the freedom to do these things. And by doing them, we feel real freedom, real simcha, real joy, because freedom and joy are, they, they, they work off each other, which is one reason, another reason why it's so good when we're commanded, especially when it's always good to be happy, full of uh, simcha, but especially when we're commanded to be Sameach, whether it's our any of our pest festival programmates or Purim or Shabbat or any other occasion, it's so important to embrace that because in Simcha is Chirut, freedom, and in freedom is Simcha. It's a good world, we need to make the best of it, and Torah is here to help us do that. Thank you so much for being with me, Temple Talk.